This afternoon, I want to share on the humility of Christ. I mean, that's a, actually when you start looking into it, it's a big subject. It's a big topic. And the more that I studied and the more that I looked at it, the more overwhelmed I began to feel. Because it's, it's everywhere you look in scripture, you see humility. Humility is the seal of heaven. Humility is the hallmark of a true believer who's walking with the Lord. Amen. And so this last night, I'm going to share what I shared during worship because I believe that it's the key to what God's wanting to say this afternoon. Um, last night when I went to bed, I had an experience with the Lord that I've never had before. And it was like he took me to it. He took me to a different place. But it was like being in the bowels of the earth. And all around me, everything was moving. Everything was shifting. And it wasn't, these weren't small things. These were large things, monumental things moving and being realigned. Amen. Being coming into a different order, coming into a different place. And even I saw the, the tectonic plates that are in the earth. You know, when they shift, we get an earthquake. Something's happened and change comes. Even underneath my feet, in the place, in the spirit where I would normally be able to stand, there was, everything was moving, everything was shifting. And I was not fearful, but, but I was afraid because this was a place I'd never been in before. And it was so big. There's change coming. God is doing something monumental. This training school, God has shifted the gear. He's bringing us into something new. Now you might think, oh, we've heard that before. God's always doing something new. Yes, amen. He is because he's always busy doing his work. Amen. He's not bringing us stale things. He's always on the move. He led the Israelites through the desert. Sometimes they camped, and, but sometimes they moved. And it's time for us as a company to move on in the things of God. Amen. The things that have been that are being set in motion now cannot be changed because it's not in that sense us changing them it's the lord who's changing them it's him who's bringing change to us amen and this morning when i woke up i was still in that place really i just i'm still there and i sometimes i feel like i just want to put my hand out and steady myself because it's like a it's just everything's just moving just these big things moving, so powerful, a um, um, powerful movement of God. And I saw that the Lord showed me to keep walking through the change. Don't stand still, don't be afraid, keep your eyes on Jesus and keep walking because this is a new season. I believe that God is going to bring us into something tremendous. Something that exceeds your imagination. Something that you haven't even considered yet. Those are, for me, scary words. And I say those things in fear and trepidation. In the fear of God, he's about to move, amen? Those things that he's moving cannot be changed. But they're wonderful things, amen? Change is never easy for us. Change can be very, very difficult. And for me, last night I was where I normally would be in the spirit with the Lord. Suddenly that, that place wasn't underneath me anymore. And I was in a different place. But it's God moving us. Amen. And we're safe in that place because we're in God. Amen. So in these days to come that the Lord is going to do something amazing in us, we need to learn how to walk in humility. Because I believe God's going to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask, think or imagine. God has a wonderful plan for us, amen? Although the shifting and the changing is phenomenal and can be a bit frightening, it's God. And so his plans and purposes for us are always yes and amen. His promises for us are always yes and amen. He's always for us. God is with us. 
And he has a plan to prosper us and to cause us to grow up and to move on with him. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 5. This first part of this passage is talking about submission, being submitted. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another. The key to the things that God is doing is, for us is to be submitted to one another. Being submitted to the elders. Being submitted to one another in love. Preferring one another. We're going to look at that later. And be clothed with humility. So we need to put on humility. We need to clothe ourselves in humility. For God resists the proud. I don't want God to resist me. Do you want God to resist you? I don't want God to resist me. Clothe yourself in humility. But he gives grace to the humble. If you'll humble yourself before him, if you'll clothe yourself in humility, he'll give you grace, amen? Grace to walk in the things that are coming, the things that the Lord is doing in the midst of us, that he's bringing us into an expansive and broad place. Therefore, humble yourselves. It doesn't say God will humble you. It says there, humble yourselves. Under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And then a warning, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Walking in submission, walking in humility, being clothed in humility and humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God, Casting our care on him will protect us from the wiles of the enemy. We will be vigilant and we'll see because we'll be in that place with the Lord. So let's turn over to um, Philippians chapter 2. Janet shared this this morning. I was so encouraged. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. We're going to read first of all. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So in verse 5 it says, Let this mind be in you also. Which mind is that? Let's flick back over to the page to verse 1 we'll read from. Chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. This is the, the mind in verse 5 that says where it says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. This is the mind that he's talking about. This mind that does nothing through selfish ambition or conceit. This mind that is in lowliness of mind, esteeming others better than himself. This mind that let, causes you to look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. This is the mind that he's talking about. And it says, this mind was in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So let's just um, 
he didn't try to hold on to his glory. But I, I want to go to Matthew eleven twenty nine. Keep your finger there in Philippians. Oh, no, I'm going to do that. Let's go to Matthew 11, verse 29. Jesus gives us a wonderful instruction. Don't think that clothing yourself in humility or being humble, humbling yourself, is a difficult work. Jesus says here, take my yoke upon you, my yoke, and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We need to come to him, to learn from him, to ha how to walk in humility, how to be humble. I believe in the days ahead we are going to see signs and wonders and miracles that we never conceived of. And to be able to walk in those days, we need to have learned how to walk in humility, how to walk preferring one another, having that the mind of Christ where we don't get puffed up, we don't have ambition, we don't become conceited, but we have that lowliness of mind like Jesus. For he is our pattern, amen? He's the pattern son. He's the one we pattern ourselves from. When you cut out a skirt from a pattern on fabric, you cut out the way it tells you to. You do it exactly the way the pattern says to cut it out. Because if you don't cut it out exactly like the pattern says, when you sew it up, it won't look anything like it's supposed to. So we need to follow the pattern exactly. Jesus is our pattern. If you carefully read the scriptures... All through, especially the New Testament, but the Old Testament is full of it also. You will see the pattern of humility that Christ had, where he humbled himself repeatedly. He taught his disciples to be humble and to walk in humility. We need to follow the pattern. Jesus is always our pattern. He's the one that I look to, to see how do I do this, Lord? What did you do? I, I, that's what I need to do. We follow the pattern. Amen? Let's go back to Philippians. So Jesus being in the form of God, he didn't try to hold on to his glory. Even though he was God, he was equal to God, he didn't try and hold on to that. He didn't say, well, I'm God, so I can still do all this stuff when I get into the earth. And I should be treated like I'm God. He didn't do that. He left it all. Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant. Let's turn over to um, 1 Corinthians 9, 15. There's a word wealth there that talks about um, of being no reputation. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, the word wealth there. And the word is void. To, to abase, neutralize, empty, nullify, render void. You know, void it means totally empty. There's just nothing there. When you have a void, there's nothing there. It's empty. Divest totally, reduce to nothing. The word is used of the incarnation of Christ in Philippians 2.7, which describes his self-emptying of the glories attendant to his deity, but not of deity itself. So whilst he still remained God manifested in the flesh, he emptied himself of all the glories that were attached to that. He never stopped being God in the flesh. But all of the glories that attended that that position even, he didn't hold on to those. He let them all go. He emptied himself of those things. He became ma a man in the flesh. So he made himself of no reputation. I find these verses so challenging. And have I made myself of no reputation? You know, the opposite of humility is pride. Pride always says, look at me, look what I did, 
Look how well I did that. It can even be if you've been asked to clean the toilets and you clean the toilets and then you go, well, didn't I do a good job? Somebody should pat me on the back. That's pride. That is not humility. Humility asks for nothing in return. It simply serves out of a love heart. It just gives. It expects nothing in return. It pours itself out for the other person. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? Poured himself out for us. He became of no reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 19 verse 5. There's a word wealth there. Revelation talking about bondservant. Revelation chapter 9 verse 5. Yep, 19. Servants, doulos, from Deo to bind. The word denotes, so this is what a servant is. And this is Jesus. He became, t taking on the form of a bond servant. The word denotes one in bondage to or a subject or subject to another. And is usually translated slave or servant often the service is involved is voluntary in which a person willingly offers obedience devotion and loyalty to another subordinating his will to him can you see jesus in that description of how he came voluntarily offered obedience and devotion and loyalty to his father because his loyalty was always first of all to his father his submission was to his father he only ever did what his father told him to do he only ever did what he saw the father doing he took on that form of a bond servant he emptied himself he became void of all of his glories and put on the form of a bond servant for his father's sake. Not his will, but God's be done. Let's go back to Philippians. And coming in the likeness of men. We know 1 Timothy 3.16 says, God was manifested in the flesh. He came into the earth. This to me is the most astounding thing. That God... This, this was the God that created the heavens and earth. This was the God that walked in the garden with Adam. This was the God who um, delivered Noah through the flood, who poured out all that water on the earth when it had never rained. This was the God that spoke to Abraham. This was the God that delivered the Egyptian, uh, Egyptians, killed the Egyptians, delivered the Israelites out of Egypt. This was the God that walked before them with a flaming pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. This was the God that spoke to Moses on that thunderous mountain, Mount Sinai. This God, this Yahweh, this one. This is the God who gave the law on the mountain. This is the God who was always calling his people back with love. Come back to me. Return to me. But they would not. Why? Because they are proud and arrogant and stubborn in heart. But God always calling his people back. This is Yahweh. And now we see that Yahweh, this same Yahweh, is now manifested in the flesh. He's come into the earth to be seen. He's clothed himself in humility. He's left all of those glories there because he wanted to reach out to his own people, to the people that he had made a covenant. This is the God that cut the covenant with Abraham and walked between like a smoking oven through those um, through the cut sacrifice and cut the, cut the covenant with Abraham. This same God, have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about when, when you read about Jesus, do you ever think, that's, that's, that's that him. That's him. He did that. He did that. He did that. He did that. That's this God. Mm. This is Yahweh mm. manifested in the flesh. He's not a different God. He's the same God. Mm. 
He's powerful. Sometimes we think, oh, yes, Jesus. No, this is Yahweh from the very beginning to being manifested in the earth. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The great I am. This is the God that revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush as the great I am. I am who I am. We read that this morning. Who shared that? Somebody, Janet, shared that this morning. I was like, yes, that's right. This is the same God. This is Jesus. Have you ever considered that? Have you ever considered who he really is? All the, the things that he's done? He's a powerful God, but he put off immortality and clothed himself in mortality so that he could bring us in to sonship, so he could bring us into a new land, so he could reconcile us with the Father. This God, this is Jesus, this is the God that walks in humility. Coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, so as a man is saying as a man he humbled himself did God humble him no it doesn't say that it says he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross <coughs> humbled himself what does, what does that word mean? It means to make low, to depress, to sink lower, to debase. That's, that debase is a very strong word. To me, debase is, debase to me is when you put something really low. It's, it, there isn't any low for it to go. It's as low as you can get. He humbled himself. He debased himself. Set in a lower place, lay low, descend, humble and abase. He did this himself. He humbled himself. He put himself in that low place because of love. And he became obedient to the point of death. Let's turn to Matthew 18 verse 4. Oh, I did that one. Hebrews 5. We'll go to Hebrews 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5 to 9. I pray that you see the love of God. I pray that you see the humility of Christ. I pray that you see that the way that Jesus walked is how we should walk also. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. He didn't say, well, I'm going to be the high priest. But God ordained that he should be that. But it was he, meaning the father, who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Did Jesus strive for this? Did the son strive for this? Did he say to the father, well, I, I want to be a priest? No. Did he say, well, I, be, I want to be your son? Make me your son? No. No. It was the will of the father. And Jesus submitted himself always to the will of the father. Remember, humility means that low, low place. Who in, verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, that means on the earth, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. When was this taking place? When did this happen? Happened in the garden. On the night that he was betrayed. He was crying out to the Father with prayers and supplications, with vehement, strong cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son. And that's a capital S there, meaning though he is the Son of God, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. There's an obedience that we learn 
a humility that we learn through suffering. Suffering brings us lower. Suffering causes us to go lower. Suffering is very unpleasant. Anyone here like suffering? I don't like suffering. <laughs> but I know from experience it brings you low. It brings you to that place of being broken and humble before God. In Psalm 51, I, I can't quote it, but it says, you know that he dwells with those of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. It's that place of being broken and humble before God. And of saying, Lord, I, I can't do anything. I can't help myself. And totally dependent on you. Jesus was totally dependent on God the Father. Totally depart dependent. Even in the garden when he was about to be crucified. Because we'll see he knew who he was, where he'd come from. And he knew where he was going. He was going back to the Father. He humbled himself before his Father and said, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Let's go there and look at that. That's in... I didn't mess that one up. Sorry, I, the Holy Spirit moved something, and so now I'm like, oh, where did that go? Let's go to, no, we won't go there. We'll look at that later because that comes up a little bit later. But Jesus in the garden, he's, he's crying out to the Father to have mercy on him. And if at all possible, take this cup away from me because he knew the suffering that was coming. And that verse tells us in Hebrews that he learnt obedience through suffering. So often we want to run away from suffering and I don't want to suffer and that really hurts and I don't want to do that. But it's a wonderful opportunity to learn submission and obedience and humility if you'll submit yourself to God. It's not even submitting yourself to the suffering. It's submitting yourself to God. It's humbling yourself down before him. Do you know that out of humility, when we've abased ourselves, when we're learning to walk in humility, humbling ourselves, do you know that exaltation comes after? But it's God who lifts us up. Amen. It's God who exalts us. It's not our own flesh. It's not our pride that has exalted us. It's not our ambition that has got us to that place. It's come out of a place of brokenness and lowliness and humility and wa walking after Jesus that then the Lord brings honour because it gives glory to his name, not to your name, not to my name. Hallelujah. So let's turn over to John chapter 13. I want to look at John chapter 13. I want to look at Jesus being demonstrated as a servant. So we're going to read to 17. Yeah. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. You know, he knew what was coming. He wasn't surprised. He knew that he was going to die a painful death on the cross. He still submitted. He still submitted to the Father. He didn't run away. He didn't hide. He knew. He humbled himself. He walked in humility. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That's such a beautiful verse there. He loved them to the end. Love motivated Jesus through all of his suffering, through all of his obedience. His motivation was always love for the Father and love for those that God had given to him. Verse 2, And supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Jesus, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, I love this verse, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, even at this moment when he's about to go to the cross, he knew that the Father had given all things into his hands. 
This one who had emptied himself of the glories of his majesty. The father was now giving him all things into his hands. And that he had come from God and was going to God. He's come from God and he's going to God. John 8, 42. Let's just keep your finger there because we'll be back in it. John 8, verse 42. So we're looking at that God, that Jesus knew where he had come from and where he was going to. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. The humility of Christ. He knew where he had come from. He knew who he was and he knew where he was going. he come from the Father. He proceeded from the Father. He was returning to the Father. So knowing all those things, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, knowing that he had come from God and was going to God, Jesus does an amazing thing. Verse 4 says, he rose from supper. Let me ask you a question. If you knew that, if you knew that all things were given into your hands, and that you were about to go to the cross and die a death of suffering and torture, wouldn't you do something about it? If all authority and power has been put into your hands, wouldn't you try to avoid it? If we're honest with ourselves, I think we would. But Jesus, he didn't do that. He, he showed the disciples how to live. He rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. This is the servant heart of God. This is Jesus in being God, being God manifested in the flesh, serving and doing a job that was only for slaves. Remember, he made himself a bond servant. He made himself a slave. He willingly did that. He willingly emptied himself. And so he comes to serve his disciples. Can you imagine him clothing? He laid off his outer garment. He girded himself with a towel. And he comes to his disciples whom he's training and raising up. And he kneels down and with a basin of water washes their feet. This is a lowly job for a slave. These are smelly, dusty feet. Not yours. <laughs> You're sweet, Helen. You'd just be my guinea pig. You're sweet. <laughs> and he serves them in that place. That was so humbling for them. And even Peter says, Lord, Lord, no, 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 don't wash my feet. But Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you can have no part in me. This is our king, our humble king. Could you imagine a king or queen in today's life doing that? No, because that is beneath them. That is for slaves and for servants and for those who do the menial, dirty jobs. This is our king walking in humility. Let's keep reading verse 6. Oh, verse 5. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Ever wondered what that meant? Ever thought about why did Jesus say that strange question to Peter? If I was Peter, I'd think, what are you talking about? How will I know later on what you're talking about? How will I know what you're doing? I don't understand any of this. And then Peter says to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He didn't have the revelation yet. 
Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say well, for I am. If, then, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus is saying to them in verse 16, 15, 16, he's given them an example and saying this is how you should walk, you should serve one another. In verse 16, most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. These were his servants and this was their master. So if their master is humble and and serving and ministering as a servant, so also his servants cannot be greater than their master. They cannot walk around lording it over everyone, lording it over one another. But they must be lower than their master. They must go lower. They must walk in the same pattern that he walks. They must walk in humility. Let's just go back. I want to show you some things. I've been meditating a lot on where were you, Lord, before you came? Who, who are you? Who, who really are you? Where, where have you come from? He's come from eternity. But I've just been meditating on that. Not that I have any answers. But verse 4 really stood out to me. Out of coming out of verse 3, it says, And that he had come from God and was going to God. He rose from supper. So he stood up and he laid aside his garments. He laid aside his glory, his immortality. He laid it all aside. That heavenly garment, being clothed in immortality, being clothed in the glories of God, he took them off like an outer garment. He took a towel. So he girded himself in humility. That towel, you're girding yourself as a slave, as a servant, you're taking on humility. He's clothed himself in flesh now. He's come to the earth. He's left where he was in eternity. He's come to the earth. He's girded himself in a towel. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. And then we have the, this um, account of Peter asking, why are you doing that? And then Jesus says, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And Jesus said, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So we see Jesus taking off his outer garment, leaving that realm of eternity, clothing himself, girding himself in a towel, coming to serve, pouring out water. What does water do? Water cleanses us. It washes us fresh. It makes us clean. And, and, Peter, and Jesus said to Peter, If I do not wash you, you have no part in me. How do we get placed into Christ? Through baptism. Through the waters of baptism. That's what Jesus said to him. You don't understand now, but you will later on. Because you have to be baptised to be able to have that part in him. Amen? We've got to come in to Christ to be washed and to be clean, to be part of him. Such a beautiful picture sums up for me the message that Jesus has, that he's left everything and brought come as a servant to serve us. So in verse 12... It says, so when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? 
So when he'd finished doing the work that he had been given to do, he stood up again, put on his garments, put on immortality and took his place again, being seated at the right hand of the Father on the throne of God. Verse 13. I just feel Jesus saying this verse to us. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus is calling us on. That theme was coming through last week, particularly with Rhoda when she's leading the worship, of God calling us on, progressing us forward, because if we stay still, we'll become stagnant. And those things that I was talking about earlier, those things that are shifting, they're monumental things. It's monumental change. Those big wheels in a factory, an old factory, where there were cogs and wheels turning. Once they start turning, you can't stop them. They have momentum of their own. They can't be altered. It's only when the one who has the key turns it all off and it all grinds to a halt. But to walk in that which God is bringing us, we need to learn humility. We need to learn how to serve one another as Jesus served us. As Jesus served his Father, we're to walk in love towards one another. Not counting the cost, because your flesh will be crucified. Your flesh will kick and scream and want to rise up and exert itself and stand up for your own rights. You know, when Jesus was reviled, he reviled not. When he was mocked and spat on and scourged, he was like a lamb led to the slaughter. He didn't say a word. Can we grow in maturity to humility? Can we learn how to do that? It's by the grace of God. It's the grace. You know, we looked at God gives grace to the humble. If in our heart we're crying out, Lord, teach me how to be humble. Help me, show me how to humble myself. Once I saw, uh, I had a dream, and in the dream I had, saw this tree, and it was, it was a big tree, but it had this branch that came out to the side, and it was a bit high for me, and I had to get a balloon off there. And uh, to reach it, I had to get, I stood on a stump that was next to it, and I reached up and took hold of the branch, and I pulled it down, and I heard the Lord say, Lord say to me, if you will bow down and humble yourself, I will exalt you. We need to bow down for the Lord. The way up is down. You know, everything is opposite in the kingdom of God. It's not exalting ourselves or promoting ourselves. It's not promoting or exalting out the gift that God has given to us because you know it's not your gift. It belongs to Jesus. It's his gift and you are his gift to the body. So you don't even own it. So you can't go around saying, well, I'm this great so-and-so. That's pride and God will resist you. Mm. You want to receive grace? Who wants to receive grace? Me. Mm. I need grace every day. Then humble yourself. You know what? If you don't humble yourself, the word says pride comes before a fall. So one way or the other, you're going down. You can choose to humble yourself or you're going to fall over anyway. So best to choose God's way and humble yourself. Amen? You're going down. <laughs> oh, dear. I just, I knew when I came this morning, I, I prepared, I diligently prepared how I felt the Holy Spirit tell me to prepare. When I came here this morning, I still didn't have the prophetic way in. And I was just praying and that's when I felt the Lord say, share the, share the, the experience. And that was Wayne, but then he's changed everything. So I don't really know where I'm up to. I'm just looking for the next verse to see that's where we're going now.
So that's why I'm flicking pages. Okay, so we've talked about being an example of humility and servanthood. So let's look quickly at seeing the, the example of Jesus and his relationship between the Father. And let's, so let's go to John. We see how Jesus had no life of his own. His life was not his own. Everything was poured out, everything was given for the glory of the Father. So we'll go through these quickly. John chapter 5 verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. So when we're going through these verses, look for words like nothing and not. Uh, John chapter 5 verse 30. Jesus says, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will. Jesus never sought his own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Such humility that he had. He could have pushed his own thing, you know. He could have pushed his own wheelbarrow, sometimes we like to say. But he didn't. Always for the glory of the Father. Verse 41, same chapter 5. Jesus says, I do not receive honour from men. That's challenging, isn't it? Do you want us to receive honour from men? Do you glory in when somebody praises you? Yes, it's good to be encouraged. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a heart attitude. Where is your heart? I love it when people come alongside me and encourage me because it builds me up and helps me keep going. But it's not being in that place of glorying in that, of, of wanting to receive honour, of looking to receive affirmation from someone because my affirmation comes from the Lord. My, the honour comes from Jesus. He's the one who will honour you. Do you see the difference? Yeah? He does not seek honour from men. Uh, chapter 6, verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Chapter 7, verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. Nothing. There's nothing in Jesus. He was totally empty. Verse 28 of chapter 7. Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple saying, both, You both know me and you know where I'm from and I've not come of myself but he who sent me is true whom you do not know. That's 28. Just 28, yeah. Yes, 28. And then chapter 8 verse 28. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. So also we should be speaking these things that the Father has taught us. Verse 50 of chapter 8, And I do not seek my own glory. He could. Because he's God. But because he's God, he never did. There is one who seeks and judges. In chapter 14, verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. In verse 24 of 14, chapter 14. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So whose word is it that we're rejecting when we don't receive his word? We're rejecting the words of the Father. 
He was always glorifying the Father. Let's turn over to Isaiah 42, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold, my servant with the capital S, whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He's, he's Yahweh's servant. He came to serve the Father. He came to serve man. That was his whole agenda, was to serve to be a servant comes out of a heart of love, a heart of compassion, a heart of mercy, a heart of justice, a heart of humility. He was always pointing to the Father, revealing the Father, giving honour and glory to the Father, and he only ever did what he saw the Father do, and he humbled himself before God and men. Jesus never pushed himself forward. He never grasped at or tried to hold on to his authority. He had all authority. We saw that earlier in John 13. He manifested the fullness of the authority of the Father. Let's turn to Isaiah 53. Jesus. This is the ultimate manifestation, revelation, picture of the humility of Christ. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Just see him as a child. You know, God, when he went to come into the earth, he entrusted himself as a fetus in the womb of his own creation. That's so astounding to me. He entrusted himself to his creation. There was this little tiny baby that was conceived in the womb of Mary was God, manifest in the flesh. Imagine what could have gone wrong. So many things. To a woman who was not yet married, she was betrothed, and when it was found out that she was pregnant, by all rights they should have stoned her. But God had a plan. So it's such the hum humility of God that he would entrust himself to his own creation even to bring him forth. Even through childbirth and even being a young boy, when I read that verse there, that verse 2, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. That's what I just see that picture of Jesus entrusting himself, the creator of all things, entrusting himself in the womb of a woman. He had no form or comeliness and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He wasn't anything outstanding. He wasn't anything spectacular. He's despised and rejected by men. Do you feel sometimes like you're despised and rejected by men? Praise God, you're in good company. You're just like your father. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Before we were born again, we hid our face from him. We despised him. We rejected him. We did not esteem him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And Yahweh has laid on him, verse 6, 
Oh, sorry. Are you lost? <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> and we, she's saying verse 3, and I'm like, no, I'm reading from verse 6. <laughs> You're a bit behind, Ellen. <laughs> anyway, back to the program here. <laughs> and all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We all turn to our own way. We all at some point walk in pride because it hasn't been fully rooted out of us yet. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. You know, later on in Scripture it says in the New Testament that we should do all things without grumbling or complaining. We should be like Jesus who opened not his mouth even though he was oppressed and afflicted. He never complained. He just submitted himself to the Father. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living this humble servant king. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death because he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him because he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering, ah, but there's hope. If we humble ourselves, there's hope. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Yahweh shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. So this servant, this humble servant king will justify many because of his humility, because of his submission, because of his obedience, because he was willing to go through that suffering and be perfected. He's able to bring many sons to glory. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. He'll be exalted and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Yeah, yeah I'm nearly finished. In James chapter 4, verse 6, it says that God gives grace to the humble. Humility is the key to grace. It is how we receive grace, by being humble. God resists the proud. Is he resisting you? Then you need to humble yourself. This is the key to authority, humility. Jesus had great authority because he humbled himself. Amen. <laughs>